after all these two years. It's been far too long. It has been, and I'm delighted. And delighted to know about your program now on a daily basis. Yeah, it's going every day now for quite a while, and so it gets his, keeps us hopping and everything. But it's so good to see you. We got to we got to start meeting like this because we lost time. Uh, welcome in the audience. Welcome. It's an old friend, Barbara Nimrio Z's PhD anthropologist and a uh, broadcaster on WBAI, and has written a great deal. She's written a book called Swimming Up the Tigris we're going to be talking about. She's an old friend, so forgive us for reminiscing a little bit here, but welcome, uh, truly, uh, ver welcome very much, Barbara. So good to see you. Again. Thanks. I feel I'm almost in WBAI You're back home. when I'm here. Yeah, right. This is very similar to BAI, I think, in, uh, in terms of its mission and that sort of thing. But I wonder if you could, as I like to do, Barbara, we've got 58 minutes, and would you share maybe in a, in a thumbnail kind of way, your own background, born and raised and educated. And then we're going to want to talk about the sub and substance of your book and your research, and you have some other things you're going to do. But could you share with the audience your, your, your background, please? Well, I'm, I'm uh, Arab on both sides of my family. I don't think it's important which country they mm -hmm. came from, but they were villagers. They were right. agriculturalists. You don't think and it's important myself, what country? No, I'm... I, consider myself and those who know my work in WBAI and yeah. elsewhere know that I'm an Arab nationalist. Uh, Arab nationalist mm -hmm. like, did you like um, uh, Nasser or the idea of, of course, Arab nationalism? Of course, yeah. and I'm very yeah. sad that essentially yeah. Arab nationalism is dead. And you it think it is died, dead? Yes, and it died, I think, and I think that was one of the purposes of the attack on Iraq. And okay. uh, it is really very, very weak now. You can see from meetings of the Arab League and uh -huh. other issues that Nasser introduced. In any case, I okay, remain good. an Arab nationalist at okay, many good. levels. Very good. Okay. Uh, I was brought up in Canada, actually, okay. so maybe some of your viewers will detect my Canadian accent. I did hear an oot. Out and a boat. Yes, right. And um, educated initially in biology at Queen's University. In, Where is that? That's just across the border from Watertown in New York. Okay, uh, right. It's Kingston, Ontario. Okay, I right. took a degree there. Mm -hmm. And then actually spent three years in India, my oh, really? first foray into the rest of the world, that yeah. great world out there. Uh -huh. And after that, uh -huh. joined the University of London, where I did my master's and then my Ph.D. in anthropology, okay, good. specializing okay. mm -hmm. in the Tibetan peoples. Because when mm -hmm. I was in India for three years, mm -hmm. that was in the early 60s, just after Tibetans had uh, left, fled yeah. uh, from Tibet, right. which was taken over, many people will know, by the Chinese. Yes. So I spent three years working with Tibetan refugees, and then during my Ph.D. went back mm -hmm. to Nepal, not yet Tibet. Mm -hmm. I did go to Tibet uh, later in the 80s. You did, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, went back to Nepal, largely, and did my Ph.D., working with Tibetans settled in Nepal and remained working as an anthropologist uh -huh. in Nepal, in various parts of Nepal, with Nepali-speaking and other uh, peoples of Nepal for 18 years. That was very... Mm. 18? 18? That's 18 a years. long stint. And my first yeah. three books, uh -huh. actually, focus on Tibetan and other Nepali peoples. Very good. Could mm. you tick them off, maybe? What books have you written? You wrote three books. The about, first one was yeah. called Tibetan Frontier Families, okay. which using um, material that I gathered from Tibetan refugees <coughs> mm -hmm. in the Everest area of mm -hmm. Nepal, I recreated a place called Dingri. Mm -hmm. Tibetan Frontier Families is the story of the people of Dingri. Dingri is just north of Everest, just at the foot of Everest. Wow, okay. And now it's a well-traveled route because many foreigners, tourists, go through that part of Tibet to between Nepal and Lhasa. I see. The okay. second book was called Soundings in Tibetan Civilization, okay. which was actually an edited volume of an international conference. Mm -hmm. My third book is was based on my work after I had uh, been alerted to the importance of women in all our societies. Right and the, neg neg the way that anthropologists had, in fact, neglected uh -huh. the histories of women and the culture of women and the knowledge of women. And this was a study of women in East Nepal. These were Nepali-speaking, in fact, Brahmin women, uh -huh. and it's called Heir to a Silent Song. That's a lovely title. Isn't that a lovely title? It Air is, to a yeah. Silent song. The silent song being the feminine principle, or what are being you trying to do? the yeah. struggles, yeah. The, re the rebellion yeah. by leading Nepali women in yeah. East Nepal who fought against the monarchy 
uh -huh. in the middle of the 20th century. The silent song. I do like that. Heir that was to good. a silent song, yeah. which comes into who who are the heirs, who, yeah. who are the people who pick up that silent song and uh -huh. make it vocal and carry on the struggle for justice. Yeah, because that silent song's probably been carried in the soul of people over a long period of time where they had to button down in order to survive. Indeed, indeed. And Bobby Dylan had a song, uh, something was blowing in the wind. Maybe it was a silent song that was blowing in the wind back in the 60s, if you recall. It is I, a powerful I, symbol. It's interesting. Of, Anthropology uh, is a great field. Is it divided down like geography? We were just chatting oh, about yes. academic disciplines. Yes. And geography, you can get away with any, You can be interested in almost anything yes. and call it physical, mental, we, we physical, uh, you know, too. cultural, all this. Same yeah. with anthropology. Absolutely. It's a pretty wide tableau you're writing. Anthropology. You're right. There's psychological and I don't don't ask me what they are. There's yeah. urban anthropology, right. rural anthropology, the anthropology of sex, the anthropology of all fields, really. Yeah. And now, of course, because we understand that no peoples are isolated. Yeah. We're not going off to a, a Mel Melanesian island mm -hmm. or a Himalayan village mm -hmm. and working with people who have never changed over centuries yeah. and millennia. Aren't people there is yeah. there is dynamism in yeah. all societies, yes. and there is probably no society today which does not use a cell phone mm. or have content. Certainly, are exposed yeah. to. Uh, all kinds of, of uh, high tech or even low tech. Yeah. And so, as a result, many of us are doing research in our own communities. Right. You know, and, and now anthropology may be labeled something like ethnic studies, right. which a lot of people don't like, right. of course. And you can do anthropology in. Uh, there's a, a famous anthropologist who joined a community of. Um, criminal gangs, let's call them, right. in Chicago. Okay. And he wrote a book, uh, Becoming a Member of a Gang for a it's Day, something like that. yeah, yeah. So what are the closest uh, dis is sister disciplines like? I think, I don't think I've ever met a sociologist I didn't like. They seem to well, be they're interested very close. in their anthropology, sociology, and I've never met an anthropologist I didn't like. In I don't fact, think. In fact, in how come in Britain, they seem to be such fine, stalwart people, the anthropologists be, and sociologists? Because you have to be tough, really, to yeah. live in a community that you're not n a, a normal member of and join that community wholeheartedly, uh -huh. and not be afraid to be very uh -huh. comfortable in any kind of situation because uh -huh. you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, on the question of sociology, though, yeah. yes, the two disciplines I think are very close. I think. And the British School yeah. of Anthropology, which I grew you up were in, at London, was trained yeah. in, mm -hmm. yes, at the yeah. University of London, was in fact called social anthropology. Was it? Okay. As opposed to archaeology. Whereas in, right. in America, uh, we don't distinguish that. Franz Boas? Was there a Franz? He, yeah. Boas, Boas was a great anthropologist, right? right? right. And everything. And all these things are like we had Humboldt in right. our and the lexicon and geography. Do was, I remember Margaret and Mead? She, She's a gorgeous. She, when she became yeah. a celebrity, yeah. and her books were really very valid and, yeah. and exciting, and she was a very, very good writer. Yes. She was addressing all kinds of issues, you remember, in American society. Yes. And that yeah. antagonized a lot of the youth, if you'll remember. Uh huh. Uh, but. And, and anthropologists do feel they they can comment on almost anything cultural, although uh -huh. they may have done their research in a very limited area. Right, and then the uh, rapid change and everything, take those things into account. Well, congratulations on being an anthropologist. I think it's a <laughs> good calling, and that's good. And now you've also taken up the uh, work of doing uh, broadcasting on uh, WBAI. You've been doing that for quite a while. Maybe it's years. worth talking a little bit. 20 years for that long, right? And the name of your program is... it's career. How, does that have a meaning it in Arabic? It sure does. Okay. It means liberation. Liber does it? We spell it T-A-H-R-I-R, -R, Harold. Well, how would we spell it? Or how would no, it be spelled? No, we spell it in English. Oh, everybody does. T-A-H, it's an aspirated H. Wait a minute, here. let's get it straight. T-A-H-R-I-R. R-I-R. R-I-I. Okay. That's and really good. Liberation. And it means liberation. Well, you may have heard of Tahrir Square in Cairo. And there are other Tahrir streets and so forth in the Arab world. Okay. And Tahrir Square in, in Cairo is Liberation Square. And that's, a, that's an Arabic word? word? Tahrir. Tahrir. Right. See, liberation so they, is a really big, important word in my consciousness, you know. So we should have the word liberation in all the languages of the world. How many languages great. do we have? 5,000, something like that? Do we count all the small... 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you're an anthropologist. Several thousand. Well, I was just reading an article mm. recently in The Guardian, the British Guardian, about some researchers who were trying to log these disappearing languages. Yeah. And it may, may be something like 7,000. Yeah. I mean, in Nepal alone, we have over 100. Uh huh. So. Awful, there were an awful lot of Amerindian languages, but yes. they've been lost. They get tra yes. And some people say, well, everybody's going to end up speaking English or something. That would be a terrible. Somebody referred to it the well, other day are, on a yes. program that we had MB and MNN. Somebody else had a program, and it, it said it's like taking taking the language or the cultural diversity out of the human scenario is like taking the color out of paintings. You know. Or the, That's a good analogy. You, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, like that. And it's a shame to, to well, have that done. The rush to English is fierce. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the European Union has adopted English as its uh, official language. It's the big subject in China yes. to learn and English. Is, is it the, the language everywhere of the, the Internet? I, or there are other languages oh, of course. that are the there. The Internet but, has permitted that, but it is the primary one. And it's the here. language of the airline industry, yes. I believe. Yes, so, all, air, uh, all airline personnel and pilots you have to know English and use it for communication with you know in in uh, with their airports now so. there would be advantages if everybody in the world spoke the same language instead of this well, tower someone of babel tried to, you introduced yeah. that with uh, esperanza remember they really tried it didn't George work Bernard Shaw and I so remember forth. a couple of people there are studied still it. a lot of esperanza speakers but one here's little about it I don't think it took off like a species no, or something no. has it and no when was that that would have been 50 or 60 years ago. You know, I had a thing, if I could. I, we're going to do a thing next week with a fellow from uh, the, about Wikipedia and, the te mm. and technology. And you keep track of that. I guess we do. You were mentioning cell phones, and the whole Internet thing is morphing to the cell phone now. So yes. it's just amazing what's going on. But Sergey Brin, who had started the uh, Google and everything, was very interested. And they said, I saw one time an interview, and they said they were devoting a lot of the research, which they have a great deal of capability of, to getting uh, algorithms that would be able to translate the languages of the world as they're being spoken, one to the other. So you could be talking, and you're speaking in Swahili, and you have it set, and it would come yeah. out in idiogrammatic English or idiogrammatic Spanish and vice versa, and that they could get that as a matter of being... Do you think if well, we had something like that, that would be good or bad? So I, I guess it would be good. The way It might help preserve you some of the languages. immediate uh, transliteration. Yeah, it would be. And you, you could get, get it down to a chip on you your can, tooth, and you could speak the languages of the world and have them translated. Yeah, now, well, being be... an anthropologist, uh, I have to say, yes. I think, being uh -huh. an anthropologist, I don't believe that that would work except for technical purposes. I mean, there is a lot of emotion in language. Language is a chief... You don't think you know, emotion... Being, being a radio person, I'm yeah, much right. more sensitive okay, yeah. to, mm -hmm. to sound, to voice, yes. to voice carrying uh -huh. all kinds of meanings right. in addition to emotion, right. pauses... Yeah, and, and pitches Nuance. and all of that. I personally, if I think being a television person, I think when you get to multimedia with television that you get even more of that rather than through what I Marshall McLuhan would have called a hot medium. Sorry, Harold. He, said, he used to say that Hitler could never you. have survived television. I don't agree with you okay. because I think the fewer stimuli mm -hmm. you have, and mm -hmm. in radio we only have sound. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what he, you, he would have... You, there is much more investment in that single media. Well, it's also in print. And there in are no print. distractions. And also in print. And that well, creates what he called a hot medium. Something else. It, it print defines. Is something else. Have you ever tried to read at the same time you're listening to radio? Um, I have, but it doesn't, it doesn't work, work very well. It doesn't work well. Or me watching either. television. I yeah, sometimes I sometimes think I can do it, but it doesn't work. Well, that's but, a. But that, we who work in radio, and I'm very pleased to know Studs Curse. Stud Sturkel, oh, who recently passed away. Oh, wonderful, great, wonderful well, guy. A great, great radio Absolute, person. Yeah, he very right. much believed in radio. Yeah. And I liked him because he talked about the power of sound mm -hmm. coming over radio and oh, what voice okay. can do. And the relationship, it's a very private relationship uh -huh. that a listener has with a radio speaker, generally right. the host as well as a guest. Right. And the voice is what people are attracted to in radio much uh -huh. more. And he believed in the power of that and, of course, maximized and, and just because 
of his own personality, but he used it very, very effectively. So and I like it, that. So did, if I may, I don't want to be beating a dead horse, so did Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler... Well, it, I don't, they, sorry, I don't like analogies. You don't have to, to use Adolf Hitler if you're talking about a propagandist. Or... or, or, or there are others. Or, uh, look um, at LaGuardia, an American LaGuardia was great mayor. with the funny books. He, well, and he had... He yeah. used radio. He used the... Com he did. Well, he that's all radio. there was, dear. We didn't have any okay, television. Well, but he used it effectively. You think we would be better off if we didn't have television? The president is, mm. is using... He has Blackberry, also. and he won't put no, his Blackberry. No, he's using radio. He's using radio, he has a sure. radio address. Yeah, that's right. And well, I'm very pleased. Sorry, I know I'm. we're on TV. <laughs> yes, we're on TV. And it, <laughs> Sorry, it, Harold. But uh, it, it contains... I have a great it contains... We're going to... You know where we're going to end up, because <laughs> it's coming out of the labs now exponentially, the bandwidth. If we're going to be swimming in... We're going to end up with holography. So you're going to have figures walking around in your environment that will be transmitted through a thing. And that's going to be an ultimate extension of our well, multi-sensory capability. Have radio. Okay, good. We okay, will. And, we'll gonna, even this and we're going to have books. <laughs> yes, okay. And we, are, and we still okay. have books. I mean, yeah. you and I are old enough to remember mm. the introduction of TV when everyone yeah. uh, predicted that we would not I hate radio to tell anymore. you that and I do fact, remember that. Yeah. radio mm. is holding its own is against it really? the Internet, okay. against TV, mm -hmm. and against the print media. Oh, good. I'm glad that's the case. That's what I've heard from surveys that have been reported. And BAI has been there, and the Pacifica, since uh, Hill, somebody named Hill started Yes, it? I think it was Lou Hill. Lou uh, Hill, out of San Francisco, I think. I believe so, and we're now close to 50 years. Yeah, isn't that good? Which is a long time. For it sure area. is. Now, I can time. remember, I can remember, you pro we probably were reminiscing and everything, but I can remember out of the Second War, and there was no television, everything had gone into the war. I remember rationing cards and on the table. But let's and talk then, about my book. Well, we will. I'm we will. But I'm just going to say, I remember that they then came with television <laughs> and uh, a dentist family. They, I can remember watching test patterns. Uh -huh. There oh, was no programming. Of it course. was an Indian head or something, and it was a test pattern. And then came finally Kukla, Fran, and Ali. And, uh, you Perhaps. know, that. anyway, so that's a whole other thing. Right. Yes, let's and talk it was about. black and white. Yes, and let's, let's uh, of course, of course. And, <laughs> and uh, let's talk about your book, Swimming Up the Tigris. Uh, real Life Encounters in Iraq. And real it's Life very Encounters, much an, yeah. A, a melt, a merging mm -hmm. uh, of my anthropological work and my journalism, and I'm very pleased about it. Okay. And very you're, pleased. I know one of the things that you have as a great brief in that are the horrendous effects of the sanctions that were visited down upon the country of Iraq. There and was a period yeah. from 1990 to 2003, mm -hmm. to just after the American invasion, mm -hmm. when sanctions were imposed on Iraq, sanctioned, we could say, but uh, authorized by the United Nations uh -huh. and policed and developed, in fact, developed by the, by the United States. Right. Uh, verified and legitimized by the United Nations mm -hmm. and policed by the United States. And right. many of us forget that now. Many oh. of us forget. It's very important to remember Thank you. that because it is a war tactic. It right. is a war. It is. I it refer to the embargo war, mm -hmm. which is now being imposed on other countries. And in Gaza. Gaza, yeah. the most obvious one right now. Cuba. A very, very effective, I'm sorry to say, war tool right. and war strategy, mm -hmm. but it was imposed on Iraq for 13 years, That's one right. of the most severe embargoes in the history of civilization. And no fly zones. If you, yes, that and was that, part of it. And if I may, uh, everyone will probably, or many people watch this program, would remember Leslie Saul's interview with Madeleine Albright, mm -hmm. and that according, and maybe you can help because you've researched it, if it's correct, because at the time they had something like one million five hundred thousand souls had perished as a result of those, as they studied by the UN. As a result of that, five hundred thousand. As a result of the embargo. Five, yeah, as a result yes. of the embargo, five hundred thousand of which were children were dying At because least. of what happened as a result of the embargo. And Leslie Stahl said, "Do you think it was necessary?" No, and Madeline said, Albright. Think it was worth it. Do you think it was worth it? And Madeline Albright said, "It was." And people remember that, right? They remember, they remember that very the, well. That, uh, uh, fortunately, yes. they remember that. And it has been repeated, and I think it justifies being repeated. And that entire period 
needs to be retold. A lot of journalists, Howard, Harold, are going back to the early 90s mm -hmm. and the early part of this decade to expose the abuses by especially the Bush government mm -hmm. and the lies and the uh, all kinds of excesses and the way the power was uh, was concentrated in fewer and fewer uh, areas, etc., et and the growing power of the unipolar power of America. Uh -huh. But they don't go back to actually what this power did mm -hmm. in Iraq, and mm -hmm. much of the period of the sanctions was during the Clinton administration. Okay. It continued, yeah. It continued. Yeah, it was yeah. introduced during George W. Bush's, right. George H. W. Bush's right, right, uh, right. regime, let's mm -hmm. call it. Yeah. <clears throat> just before the Gulf War of 1991 right. and continued and in fact became tighter and mm -hmm. more severe mm -hmm. throughout the Clinton administration mm -hmm. and there were very few people in America but people like Ramsey Clark and his organization he should he, have the Nobel Peace he, Prize he hands I down endorse yeah. that. Wow. I absolutely agree yeah. and there were very few people resisting that and working against it I am very ashamed to say mm -hmm. there were more people perhaps in Europe and in other parts of the world but Americans were completely uh, brainwashed into thinking that as long as the leadership of Iraq was unchanged the sanctions had to remain uh -huh. and it was during those 13 years that these perhaps up to 2 million Iraqis perished uh -huh. and another three. as a direct result of the sanctions yes, as a, see yes, that that, that not a that's blood not war. that's not uh, blown up figures by a propagandistic no, this, uh, the United campaign, Nations yeah. was yeah. keeping figures during mm -hmm. that time UNICEF mm -hmm. and other UN organizations mm -hmm. and not only that but four million or perhaps more Iraqis fled as refugees right. during uh, that time okay. many of them the professionals yeah. many of them doctors and others who were really needed mm -hmm. but the the hospitals were collapsing due to the sanctions mm -hmm. many other middle class people who couldn't find work because mm -hmm. the economy collapsed right. uh, fled during that period mm -hmm. and we need to remember what sanctions can do our government knows what it's doing mm -hmm. what it imposes these sanctions right. And they were imposed. Can you believe you you live in New York? Or yeah. You know people in the United Nations. You know yeah. how slow the United Nations, na Nations is to work. Right. Yeah, it's <clears> how, difficult. How yeah. slowly they work in yeah. terms of very very heavy bureaucracy. Yeah. But they instituted that sanctions regime in four days. Really? Yeah. At the behest of the our State Department. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was already drawn up. Uh -huh. and it was perhaps sitting on the shelves just for this purpose it's uh -huh. hard to say August 2nd 1990 was when Iraq invaded Kuwait uh -huh. they were immediately denounced uh -huh. four days later the United Nations signed on by hundreds of countries around the world uh -huh. almost all the countries uh -huh. of the world uh -huh. signed on and imposed that uh -huh. legitimized it uh -huh. and implemented it and ships Iraq I don't know if you're viewers will remember I think many of them will mm. there was a war between Iraq and Iran underway mm. for eight awful years awful for the 80s it was grinding all on. through that period yeah. but Iraq became an import dependent country okay. because all its young men were sent to the front mm -hmm. and the western powers who were supporting Iraq mm -hmm. during that those against years, the Shia threat against the Iran were everything. supplying arms mm -hmm. and also giving letters of credit mm -hmm. and supplying whatever Iraq wanted mm -hmm. from cars to spare parts for all kinds of machinery mm -hmm. to wheat to uh, medicines mm -hmm. Iraq became 90 percent dependent on foreign imports mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when the sanctions was imposed and they were developed they were a widely developed high, highly developed country very, very. they were about to become a first world nation well they, they had, were going to host the non-alignment movement and yes, uh, and he they was were also very in the leadership and he was also pan-arab in his sentiment very much yeah very maybe much. the last of the pan-arab uh, it looks like it doesn't it? Uh, I'm not sure it may come back it, no, it looks like well he was things change lost. but anyway yes, go ahead yeah could come back. so all of those things so, and so one would want to know why what was the rationale just, behind it by the people who wanted to attack um, well, I, 
Iraq. I think it was a way of destroying the country. Why? By whom? Whose interests? It. What was the thinking? What was the geopolitical strategy? Who were the players? Why did that happen? That whole attack upon mm -hmm. Iraq. Neither Renfrew, who we both our know, both, said that colleague, there, there was something she, like, Mr. Friedman will write, we need to have countries that are secular, respect the right of women and so forth, and Iraq was secular. And 60% of the people in the Congress, if I'm not mistaken, were women. Well, whether or not they were, women were everywhere in yeah, the Yeah, and they were they respected were in, the in the society. In, in the and society, that, and very he, much. I, maybe it was because he was pan-Arab, supported the Palestinians. But whatever was the reason behind it, Mr. Bush was able to get a, a, a coalition of people around that. But the cause is Bellis was probably really Kuwait for slant drilling and that sort of thing. So history is a strange kind of thing to understand. But the sanctions thing is a point of swimming up the Tigris, I think, that you're trying to make. That's the devastation. One of the major points, because I went to Iraq almost 40 times during that 13-year really? period. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. I was going about three times a year, uh -huh. I could believe it. And okay. I had some modest funding, and I yeah. was reporting to WBAI Radio, Good. Pacifica okay. Radio. So Wonderful. I was sending dispatches from Baghdad right. to Pacifica, mainly here in, in New York uh -huh. at WBAI, and also writing a number of articles because Re there was very, very little coming out. Okay. So I was able, uh, and I was able to live very modestly inside mm. Iraq. Okay. And, um, and this is, you know, you know, the commitment of people like ourselves in, mm. in the Manhattan Neighborhood Network and yeah. also Pacifica Network, yeah. unpaid, but we believe in an issue. Mm -hmm. I worked a little bit with the International Action Center, but oh, mainly yeah. as a freelance journalist. Uh -huh. So I was sending dispatches back and believed very much the more I saw of the sanctions, the mm. more I got to know Iraqi people, mm -hmm. the more I learned about its history and its politics, especially modern mm. uh, history, I was convinced that mm. this was wrong. And the, the, whole, the whole attack? The sanctions. Uh, yeah, the sanctions. The okay, sanctions yeah. were wrong. Okay. And, I mean, the, the, the rest of the world also saw it, but it was very difficult informing Americans about it. There was a complete blackout. We talk about major media now giving a slanted view of the world. Well, it was much worse then because we now have alternative media, such as Manhattan Neighborhood Networks, such yeah. as uh, so many. WBAI, new, the, WBAI and or many the Pacifica, other alternative yeah. networks. Yeah. Internet. And Internet. Yeah, but huh? in the early 90s, mm -hmm. all through the 90s, very, very limited, very difficult. Uh -huh. So I worked very hard with a few other people. Voices in the Wilderness came up, led yes. by Kathy Kelly. Yes, who right. Who did some very important work coming back, informing Americans. Uh, the Europeans and the Americans were the last to really recognize, and a lot of them, even today, do not. And this mm -hmm. is why I felt I had to gather my material together and publish this book, it just came out in 2007, yes. University Press of Florida. Yeah, okay. So, And the book is anthropologically, uh, is well, it very political? Well, I use my or? skills. Yes, no, right. I, I don't think it's very political. I okay. use my, my uh -huh. skills as an anthropologist yeah, and I've read to some check of, my data. Yeah, I've read some, some of it you sent along to me. It was really well written. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, it I've has worked a poetic in quality to yes, it. Yes, yeah. it's not a traditional, yeah. uh, stur polemic, turgid, yeah. anthropological yeah, right. kind of work. It's mm. not really theoretical. I want to present the facts yes, uh -huh. to my but readers. But in a, in a way that can convey it, I would, I would say again yeah. that... Uh, poetic almost some of the, the mm. turns of phrases and everything and word use was poetic well i work at that yes, i mean it's, yeah. it's, uh -huh. it it yeah. takes a lot of hard sure, work sure. to yeah. to bring out the characters also the people i met i mean right. in, in 30 or 40 visits mm -hmm. i got to know a lot of people and right. i saw them again successively over the years right good yeah uh, in addition uh -huh. to meeting new people right. and expanding my network i went back to the people i'd met before the uh, sanctions were imposed before uh -huh. the 1991 war, mm -hmm. what is called the Persian Gulf War. Right. And yeah. so I met them before that period and saw mm -hmm. their lives and mm -hmm. enjoyed times with them and mm -hmm. saw their hope and, and mm -hmm. learned about mm -hmm. uh, their, their belief in themselves, their uh -huh. expectations, their plans, uh -huh. and then, of course, saw that life deteriorate uh -huh. and collapse, in fact. Mm -hmm. And I... 
I outline, Harold, what I call mm. three phases of okay. that embargo period. Okay. Starting in 1990, August 6th, when it was imposed, right. and the entire world was just terrified by the new ruler of the world, the United States, mm -hmm. and obeyed thoroughly. Mm. Just to go back a minute to mentioning that 90% of Iraq's needs were supplied from outside, yes. the American ships and other kinds of policing stopped ships on the high seas mm -hmm. which had prepaid medicines, prepaid books, prepaid veterinary supplies, mm -hmm. prepaid paper, cotton, etc., mm -hmm. prepaid milk, stopped those ships and turned them back. And they, they, they did that by force of arms or yes, they would do absolutely that? absolutely force of arms. It, it, they boarded it, it, the ships. I, I they don't. threatened editors of uh -huh. newspapers or magazines, doctors' prescriptions, uh, subscriptions to medical journals. Uh -huh. uh, the post office was, an embargo was post imposed on U.S., British, and other postal systems mm -hmm. to stop anything going to Iraq. Mm -hmm. Countries, Iraq is almost landlocked, and countries yeah. were punished and threatened with punishment if they undertook any training. And, you know, we forget really how powerful, and, and it was willing, it was a bully kind of government, but mm -hmm. it was willing to threaten other governments. And they just uh, collapsed. Uh, in front of uh, this American police system. It's uh -huh. quite extraordinary. It quite is extraordinary, extraordinary that they're able to do that. That's just strictly uh, a man on the and ground or the man in the ship on the sea with a gun in its hand to be able to enforce the will of those people against others. We and where does today. international law deal with such things? Um, well, again, why the is that able to uh, apply that a powerful person can impose such a thing upon the international order. It's not a powerful uh, person. It's a powerful A powerful nation. entity and country and was, a force. Well, yeah. the yeah. Soviet we, Union mm -hmm. had collapsed a few years yeah. before. This right. was the first test mm -hmm. of American supremacy. Okay. And the United Nations at that time had a lot of clout. Maybe it doesn't have as much Well, it's today. there as a place to which we can compare. I hope that it can, pro uh, you know, keep its role. It has an institutional structure that's important, practically not any finance at all that makes any sense other than what people... And we wouldn't pay our dues to it that's for right. a long time. That's they right. And couldn't we, turn the lights on hardly, so it's hard to function in terms of that. But it, as a vision, as an idea, and then it's you had the coalition of the, the strong. I mean, you had Mr. some very Bush powerful put that actors. Uh -huh. No, this is pre. This is Bush Senior. Yeah, I know right. Bush Senior. Right. That's what I mean. Right. But he did build right. a coalition. The, the British and the Americans together were very, very powerful and used diplomacy very, very effectively, backed up by a policing system. Okay. So you had phase one, uh -huh. where nothing was entering the country mm -hmm. and supplies were depleted very, very quickly mm -hmm. because of this dependence on an ongoing uh, import system. Iraq had not built up its resources. Uh -huh. And what it had, mm -hmm. and Ramsey Clark's documentation, yeah, yeah, huh? he, he documents mm -hmm. how food supplies, grain yeah. supplies, yeah. and other medical supplies were bombed during that period. Yeah, yeah. How water uh, purification Water plants systems, were bombed. Yeah, 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 yeah. How electricity mm -hmm. grids were bombed. So and this is a highly industrialized country. You can just uh, imagine what could be done with a few things like that well, in the city of New York. See what happens. You just bomb the water supply or something. See what happens when we, we have an electricity depend. cut for a, yeah, a, a, a few couple days. hours. Yeah, or a day. Yeah, right. Uh, Everything yeah, comes yeah, to yeah. a stop. Yeah, because the more so advanced you are, the more. This was a country which had 100% mm -hmm. electrification <laughs> sure. throughout the rural areas as uh -huh. well as in the city. Right. It had a very efficient water supply system, etc., mm -hmm. very highly uh, developed medical system, and highly developed means <coughs> high-tech supplies, mm -hmm. high-tech pharmaceuticals. And it just dissipated the culture, I mean, in, the, well, the, or the, the in large measure. System the technical system and quickly. the people. And again, 500,000 children as a result of that period. Over a period of 10 or 12 years. And what but was the great overriding? For every one of those children, mm -hmm. perhaps there were two or three adults died. Yeah. I, I feel badly that so much of Western sympathy goes to the children. Those children have parents. They have 
fathers, Thank grandfathers, yeah. mothers, yeah. grandmothers right. Right. who need to care for them. Yes, indeed. And yeah. many right. men I know yeah. personally died of diabetes, women, yeah. cancer rates went up mm -hmm. because you had contamination mm -hmm. of the environment. So yeah. it wasn't just a weak population of young people who were not being nourished. Yeah. It was people under stress. It yeah. was people imbibing all mm -hmm. kinds of toxicants mm -hmm. due to mm -hmm. the bombardment. So we bombarded Iraq for 42 days yes, indeed. Yes. in the late winter of mm -hmm. 1991. On top of the sanctions. So that, yes, so right. that, does, can you imagine? Yeah, no, it's horrible. It's horrible. So we, that had, we had one day where a couple of buildings came down in Manhattan, and I said to one friend, what if they were then to go and then bomb uh, the, the library on Tuesday and the Lincoln Can't Center on it. Thursday? And that kind of thing. It. It's hard for us to imagine look the way the, in which we what could. What the uh, world has suffered yeah. as a result of those two buildings mm -hmm. coming down. Look at, at the way we have ravaged countries across the world and uh -huh. peoples across the world. Right. And so just imagine this population of then perhaps 20 million people. So yeah. to come back to the phases, so yeah. nothing was coming in for six years, mm -hmm. nothing. Right. While the American, uh, what was it called, the Weapons Committee, Weapons Inspection Teams went Scott in. Scott Ritter and so forth? Yes, yeah, he right. was uh, one Bayard of the main name. actors. Yeah. And then he, mm. he capitulated uh, eight or nine years later and became, in fact, a critic of American policy because oh, yeah. he knew that, in fact, the weapons had been destroyed, but mm -hmm. the American government was claiming they hadn't and used that to put more pressure on Iraq to, you know, the we forget how terrified the world was made of Iraq. Here was a country with its, its I mean, it's almost funny to think how we were hoodwinked and and misled. I'd know. like to get into that. But Why? What's the thinking behind how it? How fear was created that mm. Iraq was going to destroy the world. I know. I mean, they, they well, they have this After ability. After we destroyed its military yeah. uh, capacity, right. we destroyed its military capacity. Yeah. The, the weapons inspectors verified that Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction. Well, they did finally, yeah. And they were, defused yeah. whatever they had and destroyed other supplies. Well, it's the power of propaganda. It's very powerful. And, and, and very that powerful. sort of thing. And uh, among other things, you've got this dual use thing they could say. Uh, Nita told me, and I think it's not a pock, you know, that it's accurate, that, there, <clears throat> that under the idea of du dual use, uh, there was a, a shipment of pencils that would not be able to go to the school children because the graphite in the pencils right. might become a weapon That's by right. grinding it down. It's dual use. That's right. And yeah. that that weapon might, and if I may, I want to put an addendum to this and see what was the coalition and strategic thinking behind it, what was the link between the neocons who were informing the Republican and so forth, and the Likudnik wing of the Israeli consciousness, just a thought, but that they might be a weapon that could attack Israel, and that that is behind the animus that they had, because he was our man against Khomeini. We were supporting him. Mr. Rumsfeld wouldn't shook his hand. And what caused it? And there was great uh, that he gave money to the Palestinians that had done things in Pal that kind of thing. What was the source of the animus at a higher level of thinking? What is it that informs the foreign policy establishment within well, the United States and the it. world I mean, in is, that? You named it. It is. Tel Aviv to a large extent. It is. And well, that is, the there, Israelis, is that point made the Israeli, in the consciousness? The Israelis, there is a connection between neocons and Israel. I don't know about neocons. Well, the neocons, neocons Wolfowitz. Are. And Wilfowitz well, and those, they are, and those they are Zionists. They, they were, are very they were all Zionists, hardcore Zionists, and yeah. that connection is not right. made. The reason we're doing these things has to do with Israel. And to, now we, to and a that large point degree. is to not made degree. in the press because the Israeli lobby, APEC, has such an important right. uh, vehicle for controlling the information that gets into the American consciousness. That point is right. worth bringing up because it's behind a great deal of what we've been doing in that part of the world, don't you think? It is important. Okay. And I don't Israelis, want to get into politics apart necessarily. From, from, apart from neocons or woke, wolf, wolf, Wolf of its he was talking people. that invading Iraq are, in the 70s. In the late 70s, they were talking right, about invading Pearl Iraq, and they were thought of as the, uh, the, uh, the lunatic and, fringe. There, I can there remember are the 70s. a lot of very close friends of Israel who are engaged deeply in on the right wing. Up. 
lining up, right or left, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Because again, we're talking about the Clinton administration. Yeah. Okay. Who, who endorsed and carried out essentially the same policy? Okay, you're right. Yeah. And we're going back also that was Madame to Albright who 90s, made that thing. Yeah. And, and uh, to, Leslie Stahl. To the early 90s and uh -huh. perhaps in the 80s as well. I mean, mm -hmm. who endorsed? the Iraq-Iran war as well. Well, that was something that, what, what was that all about? Well, I'm million people sorry, died. I, 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 it was apart horrible. Apart from a million people dying, the two and Kissinger countries. Kissinger said, let them kill each other. Yes, he said, let, he let, did. He, In I public. hope they both win. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Go ahead. So, so who yeah. is Kissinger okay. also? You know, mm -hmm. would you call him a neocon? Well, I'm not sure so that I, I would, but he's out there. He's realpolitik, realpolitik. Yes. And, yeah. But American policy is very much, we, we don't need to sort of say it too strongly. It's very much influenced by Israel, and Israel More than it should decided, be. More than it should be. Israel had decided that both of those countries were a threat. Any country is a threat. Okay, so we're talking Any about country. these two countries right Okay, now. okay. And Any country that has, they had, 20, they, had, they had a large population and oil. Both. Well, and they modern, could become modern, a threat, and they want to states. come. Every, they want everyone to be divided well, are, and weak. Everybody has to be weak except Israel. They are modern states, or they are, they're American. They backers. are self-sufficient states. Mm -hmm. They are states that have both of Iraq and Iran a very high level of education. Uh -huh. There are states who do not need foreign aid or aid from anyone, uh -huh. and there are states who control, who want to control their own resources, mainly oil. And we can't have that attitude among people in the world because they might become a threat to Israel. And to the United States. And to the United States. And to Israel. Britain. And, and, to and, and to the West, right. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole world, now we've got the thing in Gaza. They're imposing a, a blockade on Gaza. Libya tried to send a shipload of food and, uh, you know, cooking oil and things like that with weapons, I mean, Med uh, we medicines. Not medicines and so on. And they say, no, you can't get the through to there. They have to be kept barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen, and backward. All the people of the world in order, because they might have something that might be possibly translated into something that might possibly become a threat to the overwhelming power of the Apache helicopters and overwhelming power of the Israeli state in that area. And everything is... Why do we submit to that? And, and why does the international well, community submit to that? we're all terrified of Israel. Let's okay, face it. why? I mean, I, I, why? Okay. You have to ask the American public. Okay. Well, you're uh, part of you somebody know, who studies is, the American people public. People like you and I talking like this are persona non grata in certain circles, uh -huh. and our livelihoods are threatened because we speak like this, and there's a charge of anti-Semitism and so forth. That's bunk. Uh, whatever. Uh, you see our Congress mm -hmm. totally... Collapsing it's totally politically front. impossible to assert anything other I mean, than undying during, support for Israel during, in the Congress of the United during States. During the massacres in Gaza, uh -huh. the United States Senate and the Congress both passed resolutions praising, essentially endorsing Israel's right to do to what defend it did. itself. Like we use a 51 uh, thing at the United States to do anything we want, but the United States now has been hit upside the head by this economic meltdown. And the assumption that historically it is legitimate for certain people to have power to enforce other people to do things like we did with the American Indians. It's hist Whoever's got the power can do whatever they want, and everyone else must submit to that power, and that's the march of history, and they accept the idea that they're legitimate, we're legitimate, Israel's legitimate, everything else is not. But that's not maybe being called into question now by the uh, tectonic things that are shaking up the whole wide world. And if you, attack, if you, if you question, Israel's in trouble politically now. I don't know what the hell they're going to do. You know, they, got, uh, they can't form a government. What yeah, are they going to do? Worry about that, that. So that question of the legitimacy I mean, of the they, Western model may be under under shaky, under effective threat now. They've often had these shaky because coalitions. we don't have a vision. Let the they future all, they've require. They've often had shaky coalitions, okay. but it doesn't really seem to inhibit their military aggression. You're talking now Israel, and the United States. Israel, you're okay, saying they're, they're, they're linked. having a They're linked. They're linked. And the Western model, the Enlightenment, the whole Western model, the colonization of the world, the pattern that runs the world, claim to be legitimate. But they don't have the vision required that the future requires. They are not legitimate historically, except that they have the power to try and enforce it. That's all it is. It's real politics. That's enough. Uh, That's called gun okay, diplomacy. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm but not it's defending being that. No, it's being shaken. I don't know if it is. I'm I don't sorry, know Harold. that I think it might be. 
I hope so. Uh, you do hope. I do, I too. I hope so, but I don't really see if any If nothing else, to stay their hand from the things that they don't know. They don't have the vision needed. They have only this power and so well, forth. The and they time, do a lot of damage. And they don't have a vision for a liberation or an effective wor- way of organizing the world. So it may be the hands of those who think they have a vision to stay their hand at doing what they don't know what it is they're doing, is what I'm saying. Their arrogance of power, that was yes. called. And that is yes. something that is uh, the West and Israel, and they don't have a vision that's adequate other than stealing the grain to well, get their that, tribe better I'm off. I'm sorry, Harold. I don't want to educate you on this because I know hmm. where, where your heart and your intelligence is, but Israel doesn't care a hoot about... Uh, Values, or I mean, this is real politics. This is the greater Israel. Is that, that true of every political vision, system minute, in the world? Zionism, is that true of all minute, politicians? Wait a okay. Zionism mm-hmm. is a vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it's, it's a, a very powerful vision. vision, yeah. vision yeah. yeah. And it drives. Mm-hmm. It drives the machine here and the machine there. And military is their ideal. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. And it it is really scary. Well, isn't and the there mil- only okay. mm-hmm. a few? Uh, you call them guerrillas, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, the resistance movement against it is only at that level. Mm-hmm. And one wonders how they dare and how they manage. you got to give them credit for hoots. Sure do. Yeah. Not hoots, but uh, they not, are clever. Uh, they, uh, yeah. It's not, you know, uh, just a wild <laughs> kind of resistance. Mm-hmm. And it's sustained. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is quite remarkable and, and admirable at, at, at some level. Mm-hmm. But then... Apart from whether they're right or wrong, look at the American public. Mm -hmm. We accept this. Um, The American public knows. They know. I I believe this in my heart. They're not stupid. They don't have to watch international news every day to understand injustices. Mm -hmm. But they collapse in front of what we could call Zionist influence. And there is also a strange quality to American uh, psycho psychology, I guess, Mm -hmm. that we can be moved by a very uh, well-engineered propaganda of demonic peoples, whether it's Saddam Hussein or whether it's Venezuelan leader or whether it's Hamas. I Mm -hmm. mean, you mention Hamas to the average American and they will physically show fear. The, well, same that, with, yeah. the same with Saddam Hussein. Mm-hmm. And yet, mm-hmm. uh, at a certain level, if you have a chance to discuss this, mm-hmm. you might uh, you might get them to agree that, yes, it is due to a propaganda. Yeah. But it's effective. There's, a, there's something going on inside the American psyche mm-hmm. that allows us to be swayed very, very readily. Mm-hmm. And cowed. In yes. terms of criticizing yes. that, it's very and, and effective. It, and so I don't know quite why that is. We have to think is. about that as yeah. Americans, and not just like an, we have look. to think like an anthropologist to try to understand <laughs> it, like an anthropologist yes, everybody thinks with like academic <laughs> detachment from it. How the hell can they let themselves be led around it's, like it's uh, sheep? It's yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, and they do. And there's certain things like that that have that. And I it's mean, it's like think, the uh, thing uh, that happened with the uh, with the Amer Indian. I mean, real politic is a thing that is uh, maybe it's got its place is that you got to take into account power differences if somebody's got all the weapons the other person has to do whatever Some, it is yes. and you had emperors in Rome and they yes. had a legion of armies and by god you had nothing to do but to submit because you're conquered you're conquested you're you know that kind of thing and that's just the reality that has to be done and but then, I'd like to take that back again to the embargo period okay because while we were cowing, while we mm. were accepting the mm. propaganda and the image, mm. again, played over and over and oh, over yeah, again yeah. in front of, a, in, in your in your uh, On all home. the television screens. Yes. And radio stations. The fear stations, that yeah. we developed mm. as this was happening and, mm-hmm. and as we were being cowed and misled and simply shrugging or being preoccupied, Around the world, people were understanding this injustice I, well, and were okay. getting angrier yeah. and angrier mm-hmm. and angrier. And it mm-hmm. wasn't just Muslim peoples. Mm-hmm. It was people in 
the South America. Mm -hmm. It was people that we may think of as third world, but it was yeah. people across Africa, whether yeah. they were Muslim or non-Muslim. Yeah, the cell phones and of course are getting around. And it was people yeah. throughout. No, these were, this was in the 90s. Yeah, okay. I don't know, people, well, people well, I meant were mean, informed yeah. of okay. the sanctions right. because their governments were participating in that. Right. And people in the street who saw the injustice yeah. against Iraqi people mm -hmm. and who saw the supremacy mm -hmm. by the United States imposing this on their own governments, uh -huh. on the Indian government, mm -hmm. on the Indonesian government, mm -hmm. on the Japanese yeah. government, on the Chinese government even, on the government of Egypt and Nigeria, etc., yeah. to blockade Iraq. And they were seeing this double standard, as yeah. it was called, and the injustice. Yeah, particularly and they started, they to, they started to become very anti-American. Okay, and, that and don't forget that was in that decade. Uh, thank you, and that was also happening when Argentina fell, and all these countries, yes. and then the IMF. Yes. They're putting structural adjustment on them, where they're beginning to call these loans and putting pressure on them. And it began. What's happening is the tectonic plates of American Western Enlightenment, post Enlightenment, whatever they're imposing upon the world. The tectonic plates are shifting and a qualitative transformation may be as Bobby Dylan used to say blowing in the wind and it isn't coming out of the established places of authority and a system of understanding is coming out of some other places and we're almost blocked from being able to get access to those except on things like BAI and maybe access yes, and indeed. and uh, some of these kind of alternative things but do you think that is blowing in the wind a largely seen Transforming, you have a you have a, 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 a resurgent Islam now that is happening apart from well, just well Islam. Uh, I don't know about these words resurgent, but Islam is an ideology which is growing in popularity. Yep, fastest be, in the be, world because it is an ideology that gives people confidence. It's mm. an alternative ideology mm -hmm. to what is seen as essentially a Judeo-Christian ideology, mm -hmm. which is driving the capitalist military machine. We used to so have... it, is an, uh, it is an alternative, and it is growing, and it is inspiring okay. a lot of people. And it is interesting, isn't it, that uh, it used to be in the 50s. You and I are old enough to remember that growing up. We had uh, Hoover, and we had the commies. We had the commies mm. that was the uh, source of the George Kennan's view of the heartland and the commies and the and everything. That was it. Now it's shifted. We don't have them to kick around right. anymore, and a lot as of Nixon these people, might say. It's now the Arabs and or the Islam community, one quarter of the world population, that is now taking the role of what the commies used to do in terms of an enemy against the system. Well, that's in being terms of a, being defined trying, as an enemy. If tried to find in the dialectic enemy. so that the system in place can claim its legitimacy historically and its legitimacy now is being questioned at a fundamental level, is what I'm yes, saying. I, They're not any more legitimate. They don't have the answer. Their system has been hit upside the head. Head like a burl. Here, this capitalist system. Yes. That's what you're talking That's about. That's what I'm saying right. about. Right. And that the earth is shaking. Right. Unfortunately, however, this capitalist system has infiltrated the societies whole wide world. all over Much the, of world, the world, creating yeah. cash crops, creating dependence on income from one crop. And so the diversity of agricultural systems across the world has been destroyed. So you don't have that, that local self sufficiency. Also, also, and also yeah. the middle class producing for a Western middle class, the highly consumptive American and European society, also, yeah. just being supplied right. by Indonesia, by Bolivia, by uh, yeah. China, right. etc. Right, right, and right. so this collapse here uh -huh. is perhaps bringing down with it many, many other societies. Well, you got so all the... It's you not got all, uh, us and you. Well, remember I'm, all the know. Bretton Woods Institution, Mr. Keynes, mm -hmm. after that, and the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World right. Bank, these kind of things. They were lending and calling, and they had structural adjustment. Countries were made to go through structural adjustment. They made it easier for the corporations to go in to take over. Indeed. And now we're being hit by structural adjustment Indeed. in a historical sense. Yes. So we're beginning to get the blowback from that in the fact that our supposed legitimate Legitimacy is not adequate to what the future requires, right, so and that's going to come from somewhere. So we, and the intellectual so class the, is so falling down on the job by not providing an alternative well, to the assumption. Ever. Well, there were moments when there were moments in the historical context, Jefferson and so forth, when they made or oh, the Enlightenment. 
They okay. had things that moved um, that were legitimate, the 20th century. but they're now reifying institutions that are outdated qualitatively and structurally. And we need new ones, right. and the intellectual community now is not taking into proper account the weapon systems are now species lethal. That's a new existential reality. And the liberating capability of the technology is now there in a way that it never has been in order to provide for everybody. We may be transcending the iron clawed laws of, mater laws of material scarcity in terms of our capability, but we don't have systems that allow By us to our, liberate. You're talking about America. A collective. The collective ability of the human society is now at a point where we can destroy the whole species or we can liberate the species. We have the ability to do that that we didn't have historically. We have, re we have Why outdated left institutions. Up to us, if you're talking Well, who's going to be we? left up to well, the maybe, human society? Maybe, the human maybe, society. Maybe, wait a minute. Maybe this is a time when we need to deglobalize. Well, and perhaps. And countries need to break away from this global system, from dependence on the United States, and work out new economies for themselves where they are far more self-sufficient mm -hmm. or form more regional trading kinds of councils and units, maybe, you know, maybe it will be good. Yeah, we need, respect. where's I don't our Voltaire? See that it has where's to be our global. Voltaire? Where are our big thinkers, thinkers that are thinking on a comprehensive scale right. about what the hell is going on? The economic system's under qualitative threat. That informs the political system. It's all under threat. And there's no leadership about understanding what's going on in a collective sense by the intellectuals. It's the intellectuals falling down on who the are job. The intellectuals? Well, I don't know where they are. We used to have some people. We used I mean, to have who? Fuller. We now used to have. We, you know, yes, but let's not be nostalgic. They are gone, although their writings are available. Right. We can go back to them, but. Where are our intellectual leaders I don't know. Today where in the United are they? States? Where are they? They're not in the world. They're not well, they're coming. Busy they're all reified. Technologies. They're all caught up with an academia that's so specialized out in reifying and getting their own job slots and getting their grants and things within right. a system that's outdated and is not adequate to what the future requires. Where are the independent thinkers who are thinking about the whole and providing an alternative that will subsume the outdated institutions in a way that it can include everybody in a liberating order is what the future requires, and it's not being presented anywhere. We're just reifying the old order. Well, I think the universities have let us down. They have. They, that's terribly. a good deal and of academia and, and the only, intellectual not community. Only because, They've been bought off. Just, just let me finish. Uh, not only because they're busy holding on, their own on specialization, and securing their, their tenure. own positions. Yes. Yes, but also, <clears throat> I think, because... They are bereft. They they are perhaps too specialized, and where they've had an opportunity, they're morally bankrupt. Where they've had an opportunity uh -huh. to vote together, to take positions morally against uh, political policies, against military policies, have they? Not mm -hmm. at all. Not well, absolute not cowards. No. Oh, yeah, absolute right, cowards. Right. Well, they might lose their tenure in terms of the. Guantanamo, you know, in terms of the uh, torture policies, You're right. in terms of military, just do, let me finish. The in only thing is we're in time, policies. so we've got to say goodbye. Also, we're also out of time. Also, our time runs out. Our I religious wait for leaders, no one. Yeah. our religious leaders mm -hmm. have not taken strong moral positions. It's your posi your chance to have had Barbara Nimmer Aziz, writer of a book of swimming up the Tigris on BAI and a regular.